before we really dig into things, we have a sister site called Ultimate Prince. And we always ask folks, did you ever meet Prince? Do you have a good Prince story? Do I have a good Prince yeah. story? Why would you ask me that? Yeah, I have a great Prince story. Fantastic. You want to hear it? Absolutely. All right. Back in the day, COC was on tour with Metallica. And we were zigzagging around the globe with them for years. And uh, I had a guitar tech named Takumi Sietsugu. He was from Japan. He had worked for White Zombie. And then he was working with COC because we were doing this big giant Metallica tour. So we needed him to help us out. And, you know, he built me this rack and all these things we needed for these giant arena shows and shit. And uh, me and him were thick as thieves. And we would literally, we roomed together, stayed in the same hotel rooms together around the world and had a blast. And, you know, we were on tour and we, he was super loyal and we were just best buddies at the same time, you know? And then uh, I don't, I can't remember where we were. So maybe somewhere in Europe with Metallica. And Takumi said, Pep, ready to speak to you. I said, what? He goes, I've been offered another gig. I was like, like who? Testament or something, you know? <laughs> he said, Prince. I was like, fuck! You know? What am I going to say to that? Yeah, nice. And fucking bastard. And I think the Metallica guys knew how good he was. And I think some of the Metallica people, they reached out to Metallica's text because Prince needed a tech. So they went to the top of the fucking list. And they said, this guy in the opening band, COC's tech is fantastic. And that little fucker ended up working for Prince for fucking 12 years or something. Ran Paisley Park and a whole nine yards. Wow. Yeah. Do you ever see him after that? Takumi? Yeah. Yeah, we're still buddies. You know, I think he went off with Bon Jovi after that. Yeah. You know, oh, that's cool. But I did get a purple fucking Wawa pedal out of it. Hell yeah. That's what I wondered was. I wonder what the aftershocks were that came out of that experience. Yeah. That's cool. You know, yeah, that's my Prince story. Something you mentioned, um, you know, in the context, in, in, in the course of that whole Prince story, um, you talked about your guy building stuff to get you ready to go out with Metallica. And that's a pretty good illustration there. Like, that probably was the biggest touring you guys had ever done. Like, what was it like making that jump to arenas like that? There were some I'm, preparations, it seems. Huge preparations. Yeah. The whole thing started as Metallica. We were in London. Oh, I'm sorry. Metallica was in London and they were going to do a secret show at the LA 2A in London. We were on tour in the United States and they called us up and wanted us to be a special guest on this secret show. So I think they changed their name. I think they were called Harvester of Sorrow or some shit like that. Yeah. And we were, I can't remember what we called ourselves. Probably something stupid like Albatross or something. I don't fucking know. I can't remember. <laughs> but they flew us over there to play as one show. I think it was just a little test just so they could see us, you know, behind the radar and see what was going on. And uh, it ended up, it was a killer little secret show and we but they're like dude your gear sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> one thing led to another and Hetfield hooked us up with a bunch of people and we got to Kumi involved and next thing I knew we came back like two months later or something and we were rehearsing in a blimp hangar in Birmingham England you wow. know in the round yeah you know so our, our little club punk rock amps weren't gonna fucking make it so, yeah, Takumi was in charge of helping create all that stuff. I just needed stuff that could be movable and packable and in trucks and blah, blah, blah. I know that, like, obviously, Headfield's on Wise Blood, but, like, how did you how did you guys come to know those guys in the first place? Uh, man, I, I, I'd known Het from, like, kind of like Master of Puppets tour, sort of. Mm. You know, just buddies. And uh, I had had a... I remember they played a long time ago and they were opening for Ozzy. And uh, I had a Jägermeister shirt on. Orange shirt back in the day, before Jägermeister was even a thing. You know, and they were testing it in New Orleans. I had a Jägermeister shirt and uh, in the front row, you know, head banging all that shit. I, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't really care about Ozzy. I just wanted to see Metallica. So I left after, the, after that thing after Metallica played 
and I was sitting out by the tour buses and shit outside of the arena, just hanging out. And Hetfield, I think Hetfield walked by or something and saw the Jägermeister shirt again. Hmm. And he offered me money for it. And I said, fuck no. <laughs> you know? So we started talking there and shit. And that was kind of the beginning of it, I guess. You know, but years later, you know, we were, we had recorded Deliverance. Mm -hmm. And Metallica was, had a party in New York City. And we happened to be in New York City. And it, I think it was like, they just sold like eight gajillion copies of fucking the Black Album. Yeah. So they, had, they had a party, you know. Somebody finagled me and Reed Mullen in there. Wow. Press person or something. So we went to this Metallica, you know, killer crazy party. Yeah. In New York City. Hetfield walked straight up to us at the party and said, man, that's a great fucking record. Oh, you that's know? cool. That's validation right there. Yeah. At that time. And I said, I says, it's funny, Hetfield. All I was trying to do was not be you, but I was trying to impress you. <laughs> you know? We weren't trying to be Metallica. We wanted to be like, what would Metallica think kind of shit? We just were just kind of moving way ahead in our brains. And uh, it just became mutual admiration from there. And then they offered us that big tour and it was off to the races. And that wasn't so, no easy feat. You know, no. Opening for Metallica in Poland, <laughs> having never been there, is not easy. <laughs> Yeah, this all kind of ties into something that I was thinking about really for what I had slated for my first question. Um, and I'll just lay it out here. Um, Brian Koppelman. Oh, it appears on top of my refrigerator. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so I got to get back in there. All right, go ahead. Um, Brian, <laughs> Brian Koppelman, who folks will know from his movies like Rounders and the TV show Billions, um, he has a great podcast called The Moment. Um, and Brian's a music guy who likes his hard rock. Um, and what I love about his podcast is he talks to artists like yourself and just creative folks in general, focusing kind of on that pivotal moment or moments for them that really kind of turned the career and put things on an important path. And mm -hmm. so thinking in that vein, it seems like there were potentially a couple of moments for you in the band. Obviously, the blind record seems like it would be one um, touring with Metallica and making that bond seems like another. So I was kind of curious for your thoughts, like what do you kind of identify as the moments and how did they kind of change the trajectory for you and the band from your perspective? I think one of the big moments, well, there was a, there's a couple of them. And a lot of them were tied to Metallica, which is kind of, you know, strange, but because I was such a massive fan before I even was in COC, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one of them was uh, when they, uh, when they picked all the bands at Monsters of Rock, Donington mm -hmm. back in the day and they picked up they picked picked us back you know and it was just one show and uh we had just finished the European tour or something and it just all added up but we got to open up there at Donington and that was something we had never seen before you know mm -hmm. playing, playing in front of that many people back in the day was it you know going from playing you know punk rock clubs in Leeds to fucking being at Donington, which I knew, I knew the Michelin tire and all that shit from reading. Yeah. I was like, shit, dude, we're here, you know. <laughs> and it was scary. We were there that night, and I remember being in a hotel, and there were just headlights pulling in all night long. We we're like, holy fuck! And uh, you know, Hatfield was super cool. We hung out that day, you know, and had a wonderful time. And I think we took off. To, I rode with him in a car, and we went couple of pubs and stuff after some other small town after the thing or some shit. It's been so long, but it was a big start, but that was, that was a, a beginning of a relationship that, you know, and they've always been first class, you know, hmm. us. And I guess the second thing was getting offered that, the, that giant tour. You know? yeah. It was 96, 97 and 98. The tour book was like this fucking thick. We were like, uh, <laughs> you know, that's when they were monsters, just killing it around the globe. Yeah. I mean, we played fucking 14 shows, 14 soccer stadiums in Germany. Yeah. You know, mm. some, some of the rides were like an hour <laughs> to the next, you know, just massive. That, you know, you mentioned that those gigs weren't easy. And it's funny that you say that because as I was, as I was coming in to do this interview, my wife, 
um, who was a fellow music journalist, her first show was seeing you guys in Metallica on that tour. And she said, it's funny. She's like, I was not happy to see COC that night. She's like, I think I would like them better now. But, you know, back then, first concert, like there was the opening band, you know, so that makes me think, you know, based on what you just said, like how receptive were the Metallica crowds to what you guys were doing? Uh, it was, I mean, it, you know, Hetfield and I talked about it. He goes, your only job is to make sure they don't start screaming Metallica, <laughs> you know, and never heard it once, you know, it's cool. we were, I mean, we weren't, we weren't dummies. It was just, it was just amplified by umpteenth degrees, you know, the same thing we were doing that Hetfield dug and the rest of the guys dug, it was just a bigger situation. So it was just a matter of, getting it on, you know, and we, you know, Deliverance was out, Wise Blood was out, we had the songs, and a lot of them sounded good in those big, giant, huge PAs, you know, Yeah. and Mullen was killing it, you know, the drums were slamming, and it was, and uh, yeah, I mean, they'd have booted us if we weren't fucking pulling it off, trust me. Yeah, when you guys go in armed with songs like King of the Rotten, like, you guys had some good artillery, as you, as you mentioned, with those two albums. Yeah. So, and, you know, what we only played 45 minutes or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was just, in, it, you look, it was so, so long to spend that much time with people and their crew and 28 buses and, you know, all that shit. And just, you're, it's basically a family. Yeah. You know? So it was very special. I'm still in t touch with a lot of the crew guys and stuff to this day. You know, they said that was one of the funnest things I'd ever done. So yeah, it was real. And we went from, you know, wherever we just circled the globe and hung out. And, yeah. You know, it was special, but it really gave us a perspective of what we we're supposed to do and get up there. But, you know, COC was a little hard headed and we weren't going to quite play the game that hard, you know, and we enjoyed doing it. I'd do it again in a heartbeat if they would ask us. And, uh, but yeah, we just kind of, you know, the wise blood record was a, a slammer and uh we just kept going and going and going and going and going and then it was over wow. and like the decompression mode like re-entry mode to reality was a big crazy weird thing i you bet know, i'm sure three, yeah. three years of that and then you're back at your house and you ain't been in and fucking you know like oh but well, that was cool so the band has a very interesting path, like 30 years on blind was obviously a definite shift in musical strategy. What was kind of driving that evolution? Uh, just trying to make things evolve really, you know? And, you know, when I joined the band and, you know, it was two guitar players and then we had, you know, the world we were in was kind of preaching to the converted. If that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Yeah. You know, it was like, Hardcore was hardcore. You couldn't step outside of that, man. You know, you you were you would, and so people were making records, and they were making the same fucking record just to get through the year or whatever to the next thing. And we we kind of, and COC was always kind of smart about it. We listened to other types of music. You know, we had a producer, John Custer, our buddy. He's like, man, you guys got to get the fuck out of there. You know, you guys can play. And we started. And it felt more punk rock and hardcore to be doing that shit than to make the same, you know, converted to the, you know, record. It made a lot more sense to put your dick on the chopping block. That felt more hardcore to me. Yeah. You know? So it was a challenge and we were willing to take the fucking blows. You know, we didn't give a shit. We were just being kind of selfish, but we did know that things had to evolve or we would just, we just, we wouldn't be talking right now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, and I love reading too in your recent chat with Decibel that you guys were starting to listen to bands like King Crimson and Leonard Skinner. I think we can pick out Skinner pretty easily in the COC timeline at this point, but um, I'd love to hear more about the King Crimson side. Like what Crimson albums were you guys listening to as you recall them? And how do you think that kind of funnels into the COC thing? There was a song called Visions of a City. Hmm, yeah. And that Ree was adamant about, and he could play it on the fucking drums. And we would go over. He's like, dude, we got to record Visions of the City. And it was such a monumental thing. And, I, and we didn't even know anybody who knew anything about it. We were just, I was into King <laughs> Crimson. I was into, you know, Adrian Ballou, shit like that. Not necessarily it was that it was my thing, 
I just thought they were, once again, putting their dick on the chopping block, making something evolve. It was just another element that just gave us the idea of people pushing it, you know, but not to like, not in such a way that it became unlistenable. It was just really evolving writing music, you know? So that was just a, a passion that we always kind of dug. And the Skinner thing was obvious. Yeah, that was, that was, you could attain that, you know, yeah. to a degree yeah. from where we were from. You know, yeah, King Crimson is still up there. Jethro Tull, same thing, you know? I think the core lineup, like, you've you've said this a couple times just like mentioning it um in the scheme of things but like reed is such a he was such an important part of the creative process it seems like that in a way that people wouldn't necessarily pick up on but like it seems like he was an important piece of it huge piece yeah i mean he would listen to gang of four <laughs> as well as he would listen to discharge you know and yeah, it, 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 all those guys, and myself included, had such a broad knowledge of music, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I guess most of it came from those guys from just riding a fucking van for fucking 10 years, you know, and listening to whatever on cassette. This is fucking awesome, you know. And uh, just keeping an open mind, you know. And it was always important to all of us, you know, to not, the main thing was not to be pigeonholed. Mm -hmm. you know, once we kind of set that up a little bit, it became kind of a inside joke, you know, maybe we should make an eye for an eye record or something, you know, just whatever, <laughs> just twist it up. But just, just making it, I, I just, not, none of us could do the same record over. It would just, it would just drive us crazy, you know, and not going so different, you know, we know what our core thing is. We know it works, but changing things and, and getting out there is part of what corrosion or conformity is, you know, and you mentioned John Custer, like um, starting with Blind, it seems like he finds his place in the organization pretty quickly, but you've termed him as being like originally a guy that just came in from down the street. Like what was kind yeah. of the important, what was the important secret sauce that he brought? And like, how have you seen kind of that working relationship evolve over the years? He was just this guy who lived down the street, but I, you know, don't quote me on this, but I think back in the day he worked at a, uh, what are those things called a jingle house oh yeah okay yep new york city so he had to be on the fly and like you want you know have you driven a ford lately that kind of shit you know <laughs> and just be able to create any sound but he brought over a a cassette a four track cassette from a tascam four track <laughs> and to this day it, it was fucking it's mind-boggling what he had done with that you know just with a simple couple of microphones and some pedals you know mm. he goes tell me is this the real van halen or is this me you know and he <laughs> drum machine that it was like drop dead legs or something and i was like get the fuck out of here you know and he could he could just one of those guys and he wasn't really a big producer but he knew how to turn fucking knobs and he knew how to pull the best out of us and he knew what we were heading towards and wanted us to broaden it and he's just like our fifth member at this point you know i talk to him once a week still oh that's cool yeah and it seems like he's somebody that's a friend but also like importantly like somebody that can call you guys on bullshit where necessary i think the big thing about a producer dude like that is he's more a psychiatrist <laughs> than anything, <laughs> you know so yeah and we've, we've had our ups and downs. We've gone through crazy shit. And, but the, the main thing is that we've never gotten stuck, mm. you know, go, taken off on a tangent. And then John always be like, is that what you hear in your head? And I was like, it's more than I hear in my head, you know? Wow. And, and so he's always been that type of like guru kind of guy. And when you get something and you're like teary eyed, like Jesus fucking Christ, dude, we just did that. You know, and just just by just being open minded and hey, let's try this. Yeah. And you, you know, and we always go down these crazy tangents. And, and the funny thing is, very rarely, but sometimes we get stuck and we'll just laugh and like, fuck it, throw it away. You know, <laughs> but sometimes it works. 
you know. It's probably the same with any band, I, I suppose. One of the there's a lot of highlights on the live volume record, and one of which is the live version of 13 Angels in Seven Days. Like it's really to me like a showcase for just the huge sludgy guitar sound of COC. Like when did you guys really kind of solidify that element of the band's sound? Because like influentially, you can name off the influences, but I hear those guitars and I know it's COC, like it's identifiable. Uh-huh. Like 13 Angels was a weird song, you know, it was just it just it wrote itself yeah so fast and i had the lyrics already and but once we had like the flanger on the guitar and it was doing its trower kind of thing or whatever it just fell into place and it it became bigger and we still play it to this day but it became bigger than all the little parts we put into it it became a real solid thing and it's not a really intricate crazy song but it just it really had something to it and the lyrics were matched up really well with that. And, uh, you know, yeah, it was just a weird moment in time and Custer was right there, you know, and we just went, we blazed right through it. And we were kind of laughing going, that was awesome, you know. But just generally for you guys, like that guitar sound, when do you think you really kind of solidified that COC guitar thing? On that particular song? No, just generally, like as a band, like you know, you know, kind of getting just, this out. It was it was just trying to uh, not. It had to be real, you know. Mm -hmm. It had to yeah. sound like it was going through tubes and shit. And because I think one of our biggest things was like we realized that you know with CDs and stuff as dated as that sounds, but we knew it wasn't gonna go away. It wasn't going to be a cassette that would just burn out. It was out there for life. So we were trying to create things that would be timeless. And Custer, from where his mind was at, was like, dude, we got to make these things fucking classic. Albatross, all that shit, guitar tones. It had to have, even the thought about a snare drum, you know, it had to have a signature thing to it, not just be what everybody else was doing. And, and following the song... And being smart enough to let the, to not try and control it too much. Mm -hmm. And if the song's going a certain direction, you, you better fucking listen, you know, mm -hmm. it's starting to, if it's starting to pull off, you know, and just use all that to your advantage and not as trying to be like, we're COC, it's got to sound this way, you know, because in my opinion, you lose on that. Yeah, and you talked about how 13 Angels is still in the live set. And that's something that like America's volume dealer as a record. Um, I think that, you know, it seemed like as like fan wise, like reactions to that record were split at the time. Like, I kind of think it like seems like a bit of a cult record in the catalog these days. There's what record. I'm sorry. America's volume dealer. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's people that love that record to this day. That's like really special to them. Um and there's a lot of songs from that record still in the set. So it seems like you guys have some sort of affection for that album and or the songs are fun to play live. Both. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, a funny thing, there's two funny things on that one. It was Dimebag's favorite COC record. Nice. Yeah. He was like, dude, you know, he was just tripping out on the, the, the clarity of it and everything and the way we had recorded it. And there's another thing I'll tell you that I think a lot of people know is that record is 100% Pro Tools. Holy shit. Not a real, I wouldn't have guessed that. There's not a real amp and there's not a real drum on it. Wow. We were trying to figure out, like, man, there's this new thing called Pro Tools coming out. And Custer, we just abused it, you know. <laughs> and Custer, back then, you just sweep the mouse up to make the EQ do this and pull it back. And he was just, like, trying to figure it out. Like, does that sound real? You know? And we had tracked some of the drums and used, uh, Reed was playing drums to keep the mics from bleeding. Not the mics, but the triggers from fucking up something. And he was using cardboard cymbals. And he, wow. over, he overdubbed the cymbals later. And it's, it's, that record's clean as a whistle because it's fucking digital. In, a, in, a, in an era when things weren't digital, it was just starting. But even all that, all those guitars and shit are amp farm. Wow. 
and, and but we we pushed them so hard through the studio monitors that they would feed back through the studio monitors you know was anybody I, was, i'd have to stand in front on the mixing board in front of the speaker to make it feed back that's really interesting like was anybody in the band against that like was like reed against the fact that like there's not real drums no reed was on the point of it half the animosity record is uh triggered drums back in the day side two i think is all just yeah. uh one of those triangular thing you know well, like yeah 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 back in the day but yeah we were like fuck it let's go for it but you can't tell if i wouldn't have told you you wouldn't fucking know you'd think we're in some old wooden studio well, and also, like, as you know, like, you know, when you play with the, kind of the new toys at the time, like 20 plus years on, a lot of times that stuff doesn't sound good. And it's like, so we you're telling me. Con- we were very conscious of that. Yeah. We did not want to make a fucking, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we didn't want to do that. You know, we were trying to use that equipment and make it sound like a real thing, mm-hmm. which was, I don't think a lot of people were doing at the time. It was just like, you know, the hip hop world was embracing it and all that stuff. And we were like, let's see if we can fuck this thing up and make it sound like real shit. You know, and it was a, a fun experiment. And I'm glad we did not go the route of what the technology was leading us towards. We were just trying to spin it around and see if it would work. What do you think the benefits were of doing it that way? What were the fun things you were able to pull off? Like they were it was like cheap. It was cheap. The yeah, dude okay. had a Pro Tools rig down the street. Yeah. You know, he was a technology guru guy. I think he owns Red Hat now or some shit. Nice. Yeah. But he's like, I got this place. You can check it out. So we went in there and it was like, it was just, there's no amps. There's no nothing. It was like, but it's evolved so much since then. But yeah, it was, it was very bizarre. With live volume, I don't think I'd ever heard prior to reading those album notes, the story behind recording of live volume. You guys are recording a live record and DVD and things very nearly go totally sideways. Can you kind of tell that tale for the fans here? Uh, Yeah. We were heading to Detroit to record a live record. And I'll make it in a nutshell. Our sound guy flipped his fucking lid. Either he was A, so nervous about being under the pressure of mobile trucks and all that kind of shit. But he's a good sound guy. But he, he flipped out the day of the show and didn't show up. So once again, I reached out to Metallica. <laughs> I said, dude, we're fucked. And they sent one of their monitor guys, and forgive me for not knowing, he was from Scotland, but he was in the States. And they shot him over there. He walked in blind. And fucking, we we walked through it. I wrote notes. I said solos here, blah 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 blah. And then we pulled it off, and then we had to mix it later, and it sounded fine. Everything was cool, but it was a lot of pressure, you know, because we had been on tour for like four weeks prior, leading up to we could knock this thing out. But then the fucking ding dong who's supposed to run the fucking knobs don't show up. <laughs> It's a great sounding live thing. I think it's very representative of where you guys were at that point. Yeah. There was another issue with that. They had lost some tracks oh, in, shit. The, in the recording of it, a transfer of it, I guess. Mm-hmm. So whoever was putting it out owed us something. And so I got to fly back up to where it was getting mixed at and stuff and spend a little extra time and tighten up what was wrong or whatever. But it wasn't that much. It was just some missing things that had to be added just from the transfer of the, of the material. Was it a conscious thing to do it at Harpo's? That's such a great like rock club. Yeah, absolutely. Detroit was killing at that time. Yeah. They were like our, as a favorite place to play. So um, on the volume dealer tip, one of the really gorgeous tunes on that record is stare too long. That is a song. Had that been around a little bit in some form uh, prior to that record? Uh, not really. It was, we had, uh, back in the day, we used to demo shit all the time. Custer had a studio in North Carolina in Raleigh and, uh, and uh, another guy ran it and we were, Custer would call me at midnight. He's like, dude, let's go to the studio. I got, I got an idea. I'd be like, I'll see you there. I got an idea. So I had the song and I had the riff. I had all the stuff, the main, all that shit with the 
was all there. Uh, and then we tracked it. We demoed it a couple of times. And I was like, man, it'd be, you know, thinking out of the box, I was like, it'd be so awesome if like Warren Haynes or something would play this thing. You know, so we had a demo. We were going to New York to record it for Columbia Records. I uh, sent the demo to Warren Haynes' manager, his wife. I can't remember her name either. So excuse me for that. But uh, she gave it to Warren and we were in New York City and that son of a gun called like an hour and a half later. I said, I'm there. That's he, cool. Yeah, he showed up with a Saldano amp and a Les Paul. And he, he's like, the melody's fucking great. Everything's cool. And he goes, uh, you mind if I just do my thing? Oh, like, yeah. But he kept, he stuck to the whole, my original idea. And uh, yeah, it was one of those teary eye moments I had to do from the fucking Allman Brothers. Fucking, he's like, you want me to double it? I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> and he did. In one swoop. We, we didn't take three hours. You know, but it was the song was there. Thankfully, he heard it. He knew this is a fucking cool song. And uh, it was just one of those things. And it just worked out. And he, he, it was the idea of asking for somebody like that to do it in the world we were in. But he's like, man, I listen to Wise Blood. I listen to Deliverance. I was like, fucking hey. And that was, yeah, he's a music I'm fan. Friends with Warren today. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he's a music fan, and guys like that are so cool. Awesome. Like, I'm, I mean, I know he pulled in like Jason Newstead when they, you know, were, you know, when their bass player passed. Like Jason was one of the guys they called. So it's like, you know, he he was he's into all sorts of stuff. Yeah, you gotta be careful with him though. It's like petting a snake. <laughs> damn, chop you down! Like, don't get in a damn jam band with him. <laughs> You're gonna lose. <laughs> That's one fantastic. of the best guitar players walking this planet. So how did you guys end up covering Queen's son and daughter on the most recent COC record? Uh, that was uh, Custer and always, there was a couple of songs, but that was one. He's like, dude, if we don't do this, because he's, he's a Queen fan. Yeah, nice. As we, we are too. And a lot of the stack guitar shit we did was based off of his love of Queen and our, you know, us trying to figure that shit out. But it was just something that he came up with and it was just a really uh, we were like, yeah, let's do it, you know, and we did. And then Brian May made a tweet about it or some shit that was fucking before the record came out. We sent oh, it to man. me. Man, that's wild. Yeah. yeah, he made a tweet. It was like two million comments or some shit. Like this is awesome. And, you know, I was like, what a cool thing for Brian May. He doesn't know me from shit in Shinola to say. And I'm very supportive and try to do it justice and it's just a cool it, the song's fucking insane we've always loved it we always talked about it like let's we've been talking about it for fucking 15 years let's just track it so have you guys started looking at a new record yet any sort of new music <clears throat> we're talking about it you know the covid thing put us all in the ditch but sure oh yeah you know it's insane i gotta pick my daughter up from school in like 20 minutes but or actually, uh, like thirty minutes. No worries. Well, uh, well, I just have a couple things actually. Um, on the other side of things, it seems like there's been an album that's been kind of taking shape from down. Like, is there what's happening there? We're just trying to. Everybody's just trying to come up for air. I bet. It's, yeah, it's been stupid. We played Psycho Fest in Vegas, and we played the Fillmore in New Orleans, and they're both slamming shows. We did live streams and. It was just so bizarre to be sitting on your ass for a year, literally. I mean, we had shit planned all over the fucking place, both bands. And we just got hobbled. <laughs> so now we're just trying to slowly put it back together without going too fast, you know. But yeah, it's definitely on the radar. Did you, you know, when you get back to playing live shows like you did, I wondered about that. Did you have to kind of like work on the stamina side of things? Did that take a hit in the time away? Uh, a little bit, you know, but you got enough time to prepare. 
You know, yeah. they're booking a show. It's like, oh, okay, you're going to play in March. <laughs> I was like, all right. Right. Like September. Cool. I'll start running now. <clears throat> you know? Yeah, the stamina thing as you get older is, is not is a big deal, but you got to just prep for it, you know? Run, eat your veggies, all that shit. Yeah, on the downside of things, I mean, it must be pretty special to have Kirk back in the lineup. Yeah. Talked to Kirk last night. He's on tour. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's that was our missing link. I said, I, I did tell everybody, I said, I ain't going to do it unless Kirk's in the band. Mm. I called Kirk. Kirk said, come in. You know, we went berserk. We were out of our element and went insane. And But we've all known each other since we were kids, so you can't be mad that long. And nobody was mad. It was just, you know, we were, we were yeah. losing it. <laughs> we were coming off the rails. On the pandemic side of things, like what did you get to do during that time at home? Was there anything like that you finally got to take care of, like just being home unexpectedly like that? I uh, homeschooled my daughter for a year. Okay. Yeah. 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 Drink a lot of beer and homeschool my daughter. Yeah, it wasn't much you could do. You know, I really didn't feel like playing guitar. I was just trying to, you know, come up for air and make sure that everything was all the businesses and stuff I had and everything was going to survive. And, you know, it didn't look, you know, at one point we thought it'd be over in August and it wasn't. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's, that's water under the bridge. So yeah. In New Orleans, it was, it was a dark time for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the final, here's the final thing, kind of a, a fan sort of thing. I was, um, working in radio around the time that wise blood came out and mm -hmm. bottom feeder. Um, we start playing that on the radio because we were also playing like on the weekends, we would play maggot brain by Funkadelic. So I made the case Ooh. that if I'm like, if we can play a long song like maggot brain, we can put bottom feeder on the air. So is there a good story behind bottom feeder? Have you put bottom feeder on the air every, every like, you know, you know, few days for like, I don't know, number of months. Is there a no? Is there a way you can mash it up with maggot brain? <laughs> <laughs> it would make sense. Yeah, <laughs> maggot bottom feeder. Oh man, you know it was just one of those things. Me and Reed used to jam constantly, you know, and we had all these riffs that were being unused. Listening to King Crimson, blah blah blah. You know, Custer was not into the idea. You can quote me on that. I said, we, we, we want to do an instrumental. And uh, it was just so he's like, go ahead. He rolled tape. <laughs> we, me and Reed just went at it. And then we added shit before and after and overdubbed things here and there and just pieced in the blanks and just, you know, it was just a, a really intense moment in our musical careers of like delving into that world. And it gets out there, dude, you know, and it pulls it back in and, you know, but it was a it was a really fun thing to do and just it did we we all listened to it at the end we're like cool <laughs> yeah you know? that's cool very cool we, we played, played it live a couple of times oh yeah i saw it i think you guys played in cleveland so i think i saw that at least once <laughs> a pain in the ass but <laughs> Um, final bit that I thought of, and that just is, uh, with this box set, the sanctuary stuff, how do you kind of overall summarize that sanctuary sanctuary period in your mind with those two records? Uh, they're, what America's volume dealer and, and in the arms of God, God. They're, yeah. just, they're like apples and oranges, dude. It is. Yeah. I, I, uh, are they putting them together? Is that what's going on? It's together with the live volume record. Yeah. The three things. That's just so bizarre. I think. In the arms of God, it's its own thing. It really is. Like, it's like you heard Volume Dealer, and then you hear that record, and you're like, if you said holy shit for Volume Dealer, you say a different kind of holy if shit. Played, if you play that record to a stranger and played America's Volume Dealer to the stranger, they'd think it was two different fucking bands. You know? But uh, In the Arms of God is one of my, is one of my favorite. Yeah. I had the pleasure of doing. You know, that thing was just pissed from front to back. Where did that come from? Like, like, what was that a reaction to? Uh, Cause that's another shift. It was a big shift. Uh, Stanton Moore playing drums was a big thing. Oh yeah. You know, I, I, we didn't have Reed, you know? So I'd asked uh, Stanton who I grew up with in New Orleans. I said, do you know any, you know, crazy drummers that would be interested in trying out for COC? He said, yeah, me. <laughs> I'm like, what? 
So he did it. I gave a Black Sabbath record, a Deep Purple record, a Bad Brains record. And he listened to all that shit. He's a jazz dude, you know? Yep. He knows the rock a little bit, but not like he knows jazz and free form stuff. And so then me and him had jammed together. We, had, we have a band called Curb Feeler. Mm -hmm. that done. And it's, it's insane. But yeah, he came out and actually we tracked the drums in New Orleans. And once we had got into that world of what was possible with Stanton, because he, he had a 26 inch kick drum and a 22 inch kick drum. So he'd use a 22 for rock and steady. When the heavy parts came, he'd dump on the 26. Nobody's done that, you know? And it was just, we were just off to the races and the fucking thing rode itself. I listened to it to this day. I'm like, how the fuck did this even happen? <laughs> and the lyrics all matched up and it was just, we were trying to go as opposite of America's volume dealer as we could, but not consciously. It just, it just happened, you know? But that thing's pissed, yeah. Well, man, thank you so much for the time. I'll let you roll on so you can get out the door and, you know, pick your daughter up. But this was a lot of fun. All See right, you. Brother.